Greetings and welcome to this learning session. This session will entail what to do now that your child has received an ASD or Autism Spectrum Disorder diagnosis. The objectives for this session are for the attendees to be able to define autism and characteristics associated with the disorder, identify the differences between a medical diagnosis and an educational eligibility or classification, recognize possible strategies for use in the home, and develop an action plan. During today's session, we will cover what is autism, what does autism look like, some related statistics, comparing educational eligibility and medical diagnosis, the MTSS process and possible outcomes, what you can do at home with your child, being an informed consumer, I will share some resources with you to use, and we will consider some next steps I will begin with a definition of autism and share some related statistics. Throughout this session, I will use the words autism, ASD, and autism spectrum disorder interchangeably. According to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, also called the DSM-5, autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder that affects social communication and interaction as well as the presence of restricted and repetitive behaviors or interests. It is usually diagnosed in early childhood and its symptoms can vary in severity from one individual to another. Looking at this graphic, autism can be thought of as a dyad of symptoms. Individuals with autism may have challenges in social interactions, communication, and may exhibit sensory sensitivities as well as repetitive behaviors or intense interests in specific topics. The characteristics of the dyad of symptoms that the DSM-5 has identified are social communication and interaction and restricted repetitive behavior. Social communication and interaction includes deficits in social emotional reciprocity and non-vocal communicative behavior. For example, your child may have a difficult time maintaining a conversation or the conversation may tend to be one-sided. Non-vocal communication may be challenging to understand, such as body language or gestures, or there may be difficulty in picking up on tone or voice meaning. Possible deficits in social skills may include a child's ability to maintain relationships understand friendships, or recognize inappropriate relationships. There may also be an inability to share enjoyment with others, maybe more focused on what is enjoyable to them, and they may not notice when someone is trying to gain their attention. Possible symptoms in restricted repetitive behavior may include stereotypic or repetitive motor movements such as jumping, hand flapping or head twitching, scripting or echoing the same statements repetitively, their desire for routine and sameness, such as the schedule, the order of tasks, where they sit, rituals or fixated interests may be evident and lead to problem behavior if these are changed. There may also be hyper or hypo sensitivity to sensory input observed which may require headphones, sunglasses, or other sensory items. Autism is a spectrum disorder. This means that there is a range of variability in the type and severity of symptoms that individuals may experience, and it impacts individuals across gender, ethnicity, and socioeconomical background. All individuals with autism may not experience all of the characteristics typically associated with autism, such as those shared in the previous slide. Symptoms can look different from one individual to another, including the amount of support that is necessary to be successful in the school, home, or the community. The infinity image at the bottom of this slide 
is a newly adopted symbol that represents the autism community and neurodiversity with infinite variations within the autism spectrum, as well as the never-ending growth and ability of the neurodiverse community. So how common is autism? The statistics of the prevalence of autism are displayed on this slide. As you can see, the rate of children diagnosed with ASD has significantly risen over the past two decades. It is also important to note that the ratio is identified boys four to one over girls. Next, I will discuss the differences between receiving a medical diagnosis of autism versus an educational classification of autism through an educational eligibility process. A medical diagnosis of autism can be diagnosed by a medical professional, such as a psychologist, neurologist, psychiatrist, or developmental pediatrician in a private setting of a doctor's office or clinic. The medical professional will use the criteria based on the DSM-5. There are no true medical tests for diagnosing ASD. It is rather based on behavioral observations that determines which condition explains a person's symptoms and signs. The tools for these decisions may include interviews, observations, direct interactions with the child, and or standardized norm reference assessments, as well as evaluations, including previous results. An educational eligibility process will occur to determine if the child's symptoms adversely affects the child's educational performance which is defined as having significant and consistent negative influence of the disability on the student's educational performance that is evidenced in skills related to academic, developmental, and functional. This educational eligibility process is used by schools and decided by within the public school setting under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, also known as IDEA, and the Delaware Administrative Code 925.6.6. This decision is made by a school-based team, including the parent, teacher, school psychologist, speech therapist, and other team members. An educational classification of autism is one of 12 possible educational classifications. The tools for the decision include interviews, observations, direct interactions with the child, and or standardized norm referenced assessments, as well as evaluations, including previous results. I will now discuss the possible outcomes from the educational eligibility process, such as the multi-tiered system of supports also known as MTSS. Upon completion of the educational eligibility process, there are a few possible outcomes that would then be discussed in the follow-up meeting. These outcomes would either be that they are finding the child eligible for special education services and or related services or would not find the child eligible for special education services and or related services. However, the child could still receive other MTSS supports. It is important to keep in mind that just because there is a medical diagnosis of autism does not mean that it has an adverse effect on the educational performance. Therefore, not all individuals with a medical diagnosis of autism will receive an educational classification of autism. According to the Delaware Department of Education, the MTSS vision is a whole child framework for all students to reach their full potential in a positive, inclusive, and equitable learning environment. This takes the combination of high quality instruction and intervention, 
a culture of collaboration, communication, and flexibility of parents, educators, and leaders. From DDOE to districts and charters, to schools, and finally, to students and families. Developing a responsive system of support that addresses academic and non-academic needs of all learners, as well as boosts student performance. The MTSS evaluation within the school setting consists of assessments of the student, a review of the findings, and then data collection to monitor if progress is occurring. Now that you have more information about autism, its possible symptoms, and how it may impact your child both at school and at home, I will now discuss some strategies that you can consider to use in your home. There are some strategies and supports that you can do at home. These may include the use of visuals, setting a structure with the use of a schedule, creating and implementing rules and behavioral expectations within your home, the use of timers and other transition tools to signal upcoming events and changes, creating a reinforcement system and using it to strengthen behaviors you want to see more of, providing choices for your child, ensuring you are not paying attention to behaviors that you don't want to see continued, this is called extinction, and ensuring your child's environment is free from sensory overload. I will take the next few slides in detail to go over each of these items. Visuals help to increase communication with your child by providing concrete information and cues. Visuals may help to communicate and provide information to your child regarding certain areas and boundaries within your home. They provide predictability, can decrease stress and anxiety for your child, as well as a way to have receptive and expressive communication. The example on the left is an under the sink cabinet that stores potentially dangerous cleaning supplies. The stop sign has been affixed to it as a visual to set a boundary of off limits to minimize access to the contents in the cabinet. The example on the right is a visual to increase core language to facilitate your child's wants during mealtime while also displaying a visual of where the food and drink go. When looking to increase structure, Consider creating a visual for your child to follow throughout their activity or day. This can be through the use of checklists, visual schedules, or calendars. This slide shows three different examples. The example on the left is called a task analysis as it displays the steps to brushing your teeth that can also be used as a checklist as your child proceeds through each step. The example in the middle is a visual schedule that displays an after-school routine in which you would close each flap upon completion of each activity. You could also then teach your child how to close the flaps as well. The example on the right is a weekly calendar displaying upcoming doctor's appointments and activities. This would help your child with upcoming transitions for their knowledge and awareness. Consider displaying a visual of the house rules and behavioral expectations. These should be simple rules that your child can understand either through pictures or words that are displayed in several places throughout the home. Visuals and or auditory warnings help to promote smooth transitions as they communicate to your child that something is ending and beginning. They help to provide warnings of upcoming changes and transitions. These may include verbal cues from you, auditory cues, timers, or countdowns. This slide shows three examples of transition tools. 
The first one on the left is an egg or cooking timer that will visually decrease and ding upon completion. The middle example is a visual in which you would take off the Velcroed numbers or colors that go from green to red throughout the activity to show that the transition and completion is nearing. The example on the right is a digital timer on a phone that will provide a visual cue as well as an auditory alert. Reinforcement of desired behaviors is key to increasing the likelihood that those behaviors will maintain. Consider creating a consistent reinforcement system for your child to reward them for desired behavior. This could include reinforcement through verbal praise, such as good job following directions, receiving rewards such as stickers, earning extra time on the tablet or another desired activity, or receiving a preferred edible treat. There are two different examples on this slide of how you can visually display the possible reinforcement for your child. The example on the left is called a first then visual. First is what you want your child to do. A doctor's visit is in this example. And then the the is what they can earn after doing it, which would be the opportunity to go to the playground in this example. The example on the right is a star chart. Your child would earn stars for desired behavior and then be able to cash out for a big reward once they earn a predetermined number of stars. Recent research has suggested that allowing choices to your child can help provide them with the feelings of empowerment and determination. Consider allowing your child structured choices throughout their day. These can include structured choices regarding clothing, food, or order of routine. This slide gives you an example of some of the choices that you can allow your child to make regarding maybe which shoes to wear, whether to eat broccoli or green beans, or whether to brush their hair or teeth first in the morning. Extinction occurs when no reinforcement is provided after a behavior. This may include no access to attention, no access to tangible items, or no access to sensory input, as well as all opportunities to escape a task or direction are blocked. This results in a decrease in the behavior and an eventual extinguishing of that behavior. I am solely recommending the ignoring of the behavior that your child is engaging in, not ignoring your child as a whole. Let's see how we can use this strategy of extinction to help further decrease those unwanted or undesired behaviors. We all engage in behavior for many reasons. These reasons are purposeful and called functions. There are four functions, which are to gain attention from another person, to gain access to a tangible item or activity, to escape an activity or a person, or to gain an internal sensory stimulation response. When your child is engaging in behaviors, it is important to try to discover their purpose or function as to why they may be engaging in that particular behavior. For example, your child may be crying or screaming when you ask them to clean up, and these behaviors may be occurring to either increase their time with the activity, which would be access to tangible, or to escape the demand of cleaning up. Extinction, which is not providing reinforcement, can be implemented when you are responding to your child's undesired behaviors. If you think your child is engaging in undesired behavior to gain your or another person's attention, you should block or ignore the behavior from gaining attention. If you think your child is engaging in undesired behavior to escape or get out of a demand, task, or situation, you should block or ignore the behavior from allowing your child to get out of the demand, task, or situation. 
if you think your child is engaging in undesired behavior to gain or continue access to a tangible item, such as a TV, tablet, or favorite activity, you should block or ignore the behavior from allowing access or continued access to those items or activities. If you think your child is engaging in undesired behavior for sensory reasons, like for a certain sensation or doesn't appear to do it for any other previous reasons given, you should block dangerous behaviors such as eating inedible items, which is called pica, self-injury, or running away from or eloping from the situation from allowing them to potentially harm themselves. The following slide contains a video example of extinction in action for your further understanding. It is critical to be aware and honor your child's specific sensory preferences to make them more comfortable. These may include environmental factors such as lighting, noises, temperatures, and textures. This slide shows a few views of a variety of bedroom setups to help filter sensory input. As you can see, there is minimal items in the room and on the walls. The colors are neutral and there are lamps being used to filter extra light. There is also a break area where a bean bag is available for de-escalation and to promote calmness. Your child may need some of these items to assist them in filtering sensory input that is found in the community as well, such as using headphones or sunglasses. Being an informed consumer is important when navigating information regarding autism and strategies for treatment. Being a critical and informed consumer is important, whether it's through gathering information online, TV, or through print material. Even well-known and credible reporters may grossly simplify or misinterpret research. Due to time constraints, they may overlook or oversimplify key points or limitations of research. It is important to gather information from a variety of sources, including websites, mass media, research journals, reports from conferences and workshops, and education and health providers. Networking with other parents and educational or medical professionals can help you identify sources of information that have been most useful to others. Be cautious of social media, especially if it has no data and it has a lot of claims. Look at who posted the article. Is it a source that you know and trust? Avoid clicking posts that say sponsored, promoted, or an advertisement. Think carefully and critically before reacting to or sharing sensationalized posts. Make sure article sites have research studies or major autism organizations affiliated. Read with a critical eye and be sure to ask a medical or educational professional you trust before trying any new intervention. There are many resources on this slide, including links and emails to reputable resources for your access and support. Lastly, I would like to challenge you to make an action plan of at least one step that you can do today, now that you know more about the possible options and strategies to consider in your home and community or where to go for more support. Thank you for your time today. If you have questions, please contact the Delaware Department of Education Autism Resources Workgroup at autism.resources.com at doe.k12.de.us.